All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to talk here about the methionine cycle, and this is sort of a prologue to the vomit pathway, but I would like you to watch the video on the vomit pathway first uh, because that kind of gives you an overview of what's going to happen. Now, what does the M stand for in vomit? It stands for methionine. And so in the vomit pathway video, we kind of took for granted that methionine will ultimately become propyl -CO uh, propionyl CoA, uh, but that doesn't happen overnight. Well, it does, but it doesn't happen without steps that we don't have to know. Uh, and there is one particular disease that's very heavily tested on the USMLE that does involve this pathway. And this pathway kind of interacts with a few other different pathways uh, that uh, are of relevance to us. So let's run through this pathway. Uh, so first, we start with methionine. Right, that's a logical place to start when we're talking about the methionine cycle. And methionine will get converted into something called SAM. Don't need to know what that stands for. It's just SAM. Now, SAM holds a methyl group, and that methyl group can be donated to a variety of different uh, biochemical processes. So when it donates that methyl group, then it becomes SAH. And there's no getting it back. So now it's kind of stripped of that methyl group and it's now SAH. And then SAH will then be converted into homocysteine. All right, homocysteine. Now you don't need to know any of the enzymes in that process. What you should know though is that SAM is an intermediate and that it's a methyl donor. Okay, so homocysteine then can get converted drained into something called cystothionine. Cystothionine. And you probably recognize this from the vomit pathway. Now the enzyme that does this is called cystothionine. I'm gonna write the full name out here. Cystothionine beta synthase. And that's a good name, right? Because we were making cystothionine, synthesizing cystothionine, cystothionine synthase. This is also abbreviated, oh, sorry, also abbreviated as CBS. And it uses a cofactor, and that cofactor is B6, pyridoxine. Okay, so that's how we get rid of homocysteine going forward. But what if we want to get rid of homocysteine in a different way? Well, it happens that we can get rid of homocysteine going backwards. And that's good not only for getting rid of homocysteine, but for replenishing methionine. So here's this arrow here, right here, where we're going from homocysteine to methionine. We can regenerate methionine. And the enzyme that does this is called methionine synthase. Don't you love when these enzymes just make sense by their names? Methionine synthase. And this has a cofactor and it is called vitamin B12. And this is the reason, by the way, that when you have a B12 deficiency, you have an elevation of homocysteine along with that elevation of methylmalonic acid that we talked about in the vomit pathway. Okay, so this doesn't work by itself though. You don't just take homocysteine and turn it into methionine. You actually need another reactant. And that reactant is called 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, 5-MTH, oops, 5-MTHF. And this is ultimately something that comes from dietary folate or dihydrofolate, uh, which then becomes tetrahydrofolate. Now this is the folate cycle and this is not the topic of this video. So I'm just gonna briefly run through this. So dihydrofolate gets converted to tetrahydrofolate through dihydrofolate reductase. And then tetrahydrofolate through a variety of enzymes gets converted into 5,10-methylene tetrahydrofolate. And then 5,10-methylene tetrahydrofolate gets converted to the important 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate through an enzyme called methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. Okay, so... These three enzymes in the blue are going to be the enzymes that can be deranged when we're talking about this cycle. So for instance, if cystothionine beta synthase is deficient, then you're going to have an elevation of homocysteine. And the reason is because you can't convert it to cystothionine. So you wind up with homocystinuria. 
this has got a nice long name that I have to write out for you, homocysteinuria. Now, where do you think the methionine levels are going to be? They're obviously going to be, oh geez, they're obviously going to be high. And why are they going to be high? Because the block is downstream of methionine. Okay, what about if you have a deficiency of methionine synthase? Well, if you have a deficiency of methionine synthase, the problem is you can't convert that homocysteine to methionine. So the homocysteine is going to build up, but it's not going to get converted to methionine. So you do, in fact, have homocysteinuria, and I'm just going to write HCU here. But you're also going to have a low methionine instead of a high methionine. And then you can also get homocysteinuria if you have a deficiency of 5-MTHF. Because remember, you needed that to give that methyl group to homocysteine to make it methionine again. Okay, so both of those are necessary. So this will also cause homocysteinuria. But it's going to do it by uh, essentially being deficient in that folate uh, uh, product uh, that goes into this reaction. So this is also going to be deficient methionine because this is methionine salvage. You're not able to re-salvage that methionine. So there's one disorder going forward from homocysteine and two disorders going backwards from homocysteine. Okay, and that's the three ways that we get homocysteinuria. Now, you can also get it through nutritional deficiencies if you're B12 deficient, if you're folate deficient, if you're pyridoxine deficient, uh, then any of these enzymes can be uh, uh, defected insofar as they don't have the right amount of cofactor. Uh, but for talking about genetic disorders, uh, and remember that all of these are autosomal recessive, then we're talking about a deficiency in one of these enzymes. Now, what happens with homocysteine? Homocysteine will then get combined with serine through this cystathionine beta synthase, becomes cystathionine, and then there's a lot of different reactions that can happen from here. Uh, cystathionine can get converted to cysteine, which can do a lot of things. The big one, though, that's important is that it can get converted to taurine, and taurine is part of bile acids. Cystathionine can also get converted to alpha-ketobutyrate, which then becomes propionyl-CoA and joins that vomit pathway, ultimately leading to succinyl-CoA and joining the TCA cycle. So there you have it. That's your methionine cycle in a nutshell. And the big things that I want you to get from this are your three diseases, all called homocysteine or homocysteinuria, but three different ways that it can happen. So the way that these patients present is remarkably similar to Marfan syndrome. So they have that lens abnormality. They've got Marfanoid features. Maybe they're really tall. They got long fingers. They've got scoliosis. Uh, but there's a few other things that make you think, hmm, this is maybe not Marfan's. And the big one is that they tend to have developmental delay. People with Marfan syndrome are pretty much intellectually intact. But people with homocysteinuria tend to be intellectually delayed. Another thing is that people with homocysteinuria have premature atherosclerosis. Uh, homocysteine is, it promotes the generation of atherosclerotic plaques. And so this could be a 25 year old who comes in with chest pain. You do an EKG, it's normal. You do a stress test and you find they do have some ST elevations on exertion. And then you do coronary angiography and you find out they got 60% blockage in their LAD. Not normal in your 20s. You can probably get a urine test and check for homocysteine, and there it is. Okay, now these three different types of homocysteinuria, I laid them out for you. Uh, likely, the way that a test like this will be given to you is they'll be given, they'll give you a vignette. They'll make it clear that it's not a Marfan syndrome patient by telling you there's some kind of cardiovascular or vascular issues, rather not the heart, vascular issues. Uh, they're developmentally delayed, or they've got this lens issue. Now, lens issues can happen in Marfan syndrome, but with Marfan syndrome, they tend to have an upward dislocation of the lens, whereas in homocystinuria, it tends to be a downward dislocation of the lens. So that's something you got to keep in your back pocket because they may just, just give you that. Now, as I told you, only with CBS deficiency are you going to have the elevated methionine because it's a problem going forward. 
With the others, it's going to be a low methionine. And then naturally, the thing that you want to supplement with is whatever they're missing or whatever the missing enzyme would otherwise need. On the presumption that because this is autosomal recessive, they probably do have some enzyme that's available. And so we want to maximize the amount that they've got. So if you've got uh, a methionine synthase deficiency because the cofactor of methionine synthase is B12, well, then you want to load them up with B12. Remember, these are B vitamins, so you're not going to get toxicity from them. Load them up with B12 so that whatever methionine synthase they have is working. Uh, same with MTHFR deficiency. Load them up with folate. And with CBS deficiency, it becomes all the more important to load them up with B6. Now, with all of these, you're going to give B6, and that's because you, what you want to do is you want to rev up the CBS step as much as you can because that's one surefire way of getting rid of homocysteine. Uh, so you can never go wrong there. Uh, but B6, folate, and B12 are all important supplements. As far as methionine in their diet, it makes sense. If, they're if their le le levels are low in methionine, then you want to replace the methionine. If they're high in methionine, then you want to give them low methionine. And that's with CBS deficiency. And that makes sense because the the defect is homocysteine going forward to cystothionine. If methionine can get to homocysteine just fine, giving them high methionine is going to be a big problem because you're just going to make more uh, homocysteine. So you'd want to keep a low methionine diet. At the same time, you also need to give them cysteine because their block is between homocysteine and cystothionine. And so if they're blocked there, they're going to be depleted of cystothionine. And the big important product of cystothionine is cysteine, which, remember, is responsible for making taurine, which is part of bioacid uh, salts. So that's it. If you know all this stuff, you're good to go with the methionine cycle and for any test question they might throw at you on homocystinuria versus Marfan's. All right, so let's just briefly run through the difference between Marfan's and homocystinuria because I can guarantee you you're going to get a question on this and they're going to try to trip you up. So you've got a patient who's maybe 25 years old coming in uh, and you notice that they're really tall and they've got lanky arms and long fingers and you no, know, maybe their, their spine is a little crooked and the test askers are going to be basically expecting you to jump right on to Marfan syndrome. And you got to be really careful about that. So they might even tell you that it runs in the family. And then you really think Marfan syndrome, right? Because Marfan syndrome is autosomal dominant. But homocystinuria, all three of them, as we've seen, are autosomal recessive. So that can run in families too. Usually it'd be other brothers and sisters as opposed to parents or cousins. Uh, but that can also be uh, uh, run in families. By the way, the uh, the defect for Marfan syndrome is FBN1. Okay, what about intellect? Uh, what, what's their development like? Well, Marfan syndrome is pretty much normal, so you're not going to have any kind of intellectual disability in Marfan's. Uh, homocystinuria is variable, but they tend to be somewhat delayed. What about lens? This is the big one where they can trip you up. They can say they've got a lens displacement. And we often associate lens displacement with Marfan syndrome. But remember that with Marfan's syndrome, the, uh, the ocular displacement is typically going to be, the lens displacement is typically going to be up and out. Okay, up and out. Now, on the other hand, with uh, homocystinuria, it's going to be down and in. Okay, so Marfan's is up, up and out. With homocystinuria, it's down and in for lens displacement. As far as joints with Marfan syndrome, because it's more connective tissue related, they tend to be hyperextensible joints. Whereas with homocystinuria, they tend to be more rigid. Vascular-wise, the big problem with Marfan syndrome is aortic aneurysm. They can have aortic root dilatation, but particularly things around the aorta. With homocystinuria, the problem is early atherosclerosis. So think of patients who have MIs or strokes and they're just really too young to have any business with that kind of stuff. 
And then finally, the treatment. So the treatment for Marfan's is preventative. It's monitoring. Uh, you might want to control their blood pressure to reduce the risk of aneurysm. Uh, and so for that end, you may give them beta blockers. For homocystinuria, uh, the treatment, the approach is dietary. So all these patients are going to get B6 supplementations. And then uh, depending on what type of homocystinuria they have, which enzyme is deficient, uh, they may need a high methionine diet in the case of CBS deficiency or a low methionine diet in the case of the other two. But for the most part, pyridoxine supplementation, uh, also folate and B12 are useful too. And that's it. 